Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session, Aligning Endowments and Investments with Foundation Values. A few call reminders before we get started. To access the help desk, you will see a go to webinar control panel on your right. You can select help option on the toolbar or email us at webinars at cof.org. If you have sound quality issues through your computer, try connecting through your phone or the dial in number in your registration email. And as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and a replay of it will be shared with you via email and it will be posted on our website. If your connection drops during the presentation due to bandwidth issues, just sign back in. And if our entire webinar drops, please just log back in and we will join you as soon as we are able to get everybody back online. And now to get us started, please welcome Kathleen Enright, President and CEO of the Council on Foundations. And I forgot one slide, which is questions to speakers. There is a tab, everybody, that you can submit your questions and we will be collecting those for our speakers. Kathleen, welcome. Well, thank you so much, Daniela, um, and to the others on the team who helped get this going. This is part of our member week, and so this is in celebration of the expertise that our mem members bring to so many different topics. And today, I'm excited to see the interest in this, this question of values-aligned investments, um, uh, particularly the investments we make with our endowments. So clearly, we've seen a growing commitment and action of all different types from our members and from others in the field on this. Um, it can include a lot of things and and the terminology can get a little bit, you know, complicated sometimes, but it can be everything from screening your investments for sustainability or alignment for mission and values, or holding cash at community banks, managing, you know, looking at who's managing your, your endowments with an eye toward diversity. So there's a whole host of things that can help support uh, uh, more values alignment between your endowments and um, uh, and your values. So um, you know when when we think about the non-financial factors that come into play, environmental, social, governance, ESG as they call it, this is not nothing that's that new. Um, but you know many more funders are leveraging their invested assets along with their grant making assets to be aligned with mission and values. And they're also learning that it doesn't have to come at the cost of financial returns. That was an early ass assessment uh, or assumption that is um, being quickly disproven on a lot of fronts. In our own uh, study this past year of uh, investment and endowments for private and community foundations, which the council does every year with the Common Fund Institute, it has found that increase in interest, that interest is growing on all fronts of related, or on many fronts related to values aligned endowment practices. Um, so the council's certainly been involved in this issue for a number of years, but we are the first to admit that the deepest expertise lies with our members and with peers like the President's Council for Impact Investing, Mission Investors Exchange, Confluence Philanthropy, the Global Impact Invested, in, Investing Network, and any others that I'm not thinking of right now. So we wanna make sure that um, you're tapped into the expertise that exists in the field um, from this wide variety of networks and from the excellent um, leaders like those here on the panel, um, which is why I'm very excited to introduce the three folks who are with me today who are all committed investors for good. Um, well, first uh, is Val Redhorse Mole. She's the Chief Financial Officer of the East Bay Community Foundation. And she's been leading East Bay's very creative work to align their assets with their mission and values. Welcome, Val. Thank you so much. I'm just uh, delighted to be here, Kathleen, and delighted to be with uh, esteemed guests. And uh, I would be remiss as an Indigenous woman not to um, acknowledge that I'm coming to you today from the lands of the Moekma Ohlone people in Northern California. And uh, did you want me to go ahead and, and start talking a little bit or just that, introduce let myself? Me, let me just get uh, John and Tanya introduced and then I'll pass it right back over to you. Thank you so much, Val. Um, uh, also, we have John Palfrey. He is the president and CEO of the MacArthur Foundation. And they have committed significant assets, not just to impact investments, but to uh, looking at how their full endowment is in line with values and mission. And they recently announced their plan to divest from fossil fuels. So, John, looking forward to hearing from you. 
Kathleen, thank you. I'm thrilled like Val to be here and be here with you and, and colleagues. Thank you to the council for putting this on and your staff. Uh, and I'm coming to you from Chicago, unceded land of the Potawatomi and the Council of Three Fires. Wonderful. Thank you for um, modeling that, Val and John. I'm glad that you also um, have that as part of your practice. Um, Tanya Allen uh, is the president of the Mike McKnight Foundation, and we're so glad that she's here too. McKnight has a long track record of mission and values-based uh, investing of their assets, and they recently made the incredibly bold commitment of achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions for their entire endowment by 2050. Um, I also would be remiss if I did not mention that Tanya is the chair of the Council on Foundations Board. So hi, Tanya. <laughs> Hi, Kathleen. Thanks for having us. I'm very excited to be here. Um, and I want to acknowledge that we are, I'm in Minneapolis from where they are the land, the homeland of the Lakota and Dakota tribes. So grateful to be here with everyone. This is a terrific. Um, uh, well, thanks. Thanks to these three panelists. We're going to invite questions from all of you, but I'm just going to set up um, some of the context for the audience so that you can get into the conversation alongside these folks. And Val, I did want to start with you. So I was so excited to learn about your deep expertise and particularly your passion for this work as, pre as we prepared for this session. Um, and so I just want you to uh, please start by sharing the context and a bit about East Bay's work and, and your leadership there. Well, thank you. And I would start by saying that I'm honored to be able to work for a Black-led organization based in Oakland, California. And if anyone doesn't know, Oakland is a very diverse city. Uh, the East Bay uh, has a wonderful mix um, of very diverse uh, lifestyles and racial backgrounds. And so racial equity and diversity it has been a fabric, a part of our community foundation that, that has existed. Well, we started in 1928. So um, this is not a new concept for us. But I was hired specifically because they had already decided, uh, both the board and the staff, to want to reach 100% mission alignment of all of their investments. And I was delighted when I came on board, and, and in my background, by the way, I spent most of my career as a securities professional, as an asset manager, so this is something that I had done for a very long time. Um, but what they realized was that they, they got very high grades in their programming and their grant making, and the money that was making it into the community, they have some amazing programs that support Black-led organizations um, in the community. But on the investment side, and I think this is true of many community foundations and endowments historically, the money that was actually invested in the market, and you mentioned it, Kathleen, I think there has been this misunderstanding for many, many years and decades um, that in order to maybe invest with a focus on racial equity or impact, you have to take some sort of concessionary return and that couldn't be further from the truth as we all know and so by the time i was hired the board and the investment committee at east bay had realized that we don't have to think that way we can start aligning our endowment and our, our endowment funds in our portfolio with our values but but how do we do that and so i think for any community foundation or any foundation it starts with the board and the investment committee and then the staff by hiring me i then ended up working with our external consultant and it becomes very much a collaborative effort and i will say it's not a it's not a quick process so we ended up rewriting our investment policy statement and for us racial equity was the priority i know for some it's it's net zero which is great it can be climate it can be healthcare. Um, and what we found is when we put racial equity at the top a lot of those other things ended up being a priority as well, just by um, default. Um, and so it took us almost a year, but we rewrote the policy. We came up with a process that allowed us to select emerging managers um, that were BIPOC owned. And we had some very specific priorities and it was so exciting because along the way, I was able to talk to colleagues, I was able to talk to other foundations and now we're sharing our best practices too. And I'm happy to get into the weeds as we talk further, um, but we just made some very exciting allocations into diverse managers that meet what we call a quadruple bottom line. So they're um, BIPOC or women owned, their strategies are all meeting our strategy 
and they have a financial return and a lot of them are community-based. And so we're super excited to be able to share those best practices. Well, that's terrific leadership. And I'm sure we have a lot of community foundation colleagues on the on this call who are gonna to wanna to learn more. So we'll make sure to, to make those connections. One quick follow-up for you, Val, before I um, pull John and Tanya in. Um, you know, you, you serve donors as a community foundation and you were already talking about how this process is a bit of an educational process and there are some misconceptions about, um, you know, whether or not you can maintain the financial returns, et cetera. So I'm wondering how your donors have felt about all of this, those that are uh, have donor advised funds and others. Well, this, this was never intended to be a selling point, so to speak. This was something that we were just deeply committed to within our theory of change and our mission statement. But anytime I've talked to donors about our commitment, it ends up making them more excited to be a donor. Often they end up um, transferring funds into the pools that have this commitment. And I will say that it wasn't intentional, but right now all of the money that we have invested in our diverse managers are the highest performing um, funds. And so I would just, I love to shout it from the rooftops that our diverse managers are showing that from a data analytics standpoint, you can uh, make money and do the right thing at the same time. Well, um, luckily with finance, numbers um, can tell the tale and that sounds like the numbers tell a very positive tale there. Uh, well, thank you so much for that, Val. I'll move on to you, Tanya. Um, you know, just a few weeks ago, you made this exciting announcement about net zero greenhouse gas, gas emissions. So just talk to me a little bit about um, the whys and hows you got there. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Kathleen. And I, I apologize for that phone ringing in the background. Just for everybody who's listening, Kathleen said to us, three or four times, cut off all of your phones. And of course, I don't know how to turn off my office phone. <laughs> so, um, here's, uh, but let me talk a little bit about, um, about net zero. So net zero is really a comprehensive approach um, to our investment management. So what we attempt to do is to really scour every corner of our endowment for emissions. And so we want to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions across the entire investment portfolio, and we want to pay particular attention to fossil fuels. Um, but it, we don't just stop there. Um, that's what the net zero commitment is really about, is that we also want to send a signal to the market um, that there's an expectation that they're going to eliminate their carbon footprint, um, eliminate or reduce it, um, that they're going to really try and reduce that um, uh, and decarbonize their portfolios. And if they can't fully do it, that they're going to really make a commitment to own this transition to a carbon-free um, and uh, uh, climate resilient economy. So it's that is a part of it as well. And then the final part, I would say, is that we have to make an investment in carbon free economy by making investments in companies who are showing us how to do that. So if there are technologies that help advance um, different industries, we wanna make those investments in, into them as well. And we believe that we gotta take this multi-prong approach is because the magnitude of the climate crisis really requires bold and very deliberate action. Um, and that if we're gonna really take this on, we have to do this in a comprehensive way that's bringing people along with us. Now, as you can imagine, um, we're one foundation, we have assets of about $3 billion and many people will say that's not, that's a lot. And some people will say that's not very much. And both of them are true. <laughs> uh, and so part of this net zero, uh, commitment is really about expressing to those who are both um, smaller than us and those who are larger than us that if we combined our efforts that we really could particularly in philanthropy have about three trillion dollars worth of what I would describe as carbon solutions so we have three trillion dollar uh, um, uh, amounts of carbon solutions that are not being activated that actually can help enhance um, our evolution to a more climate resilient 
and carbon free society and economy. So that's really our ambition as we think about this. And it's the reason why we decided to lean in to the, your point, Kathleen, from the very beginning, um, that if we're going to be mission driven, purpose driven as an organization, that everything has to have an alignment. Well, gosh, thank you so much for sharing that. That's that's really exciting, Tanya, and I can't wait to hear more. Let me get John in this conversation, and then we'll get the conversation going between the three of you. Um, John, I know that you also um, have are taking steps to divest from fossil fuels, and so I'd love to hear a little bit about that, that shared goal with, um, with uh, McKnight, uh, particularly since Tanya ended with this collaborative charge, meaning if, if philanthropy all gets together, then it's going to make a much bigger difference than if each of us do this individually. And then just anything else you want to share about the ways in which you're aligning your endowment um, with your values. Thanks, Kathleen. Yeah, you, you really don't need me on this panel with Val and Tanya and you there. I think you're all uh, saying exactly the right things. And uh, MacArthur's journey is a tiny bit different, but it is absolutely uh, in alignment with what Tanya and Val has uh, have just suggested. So, um, with respect to climate um, and, and Tanya's approach, you know, I we are in awe of and impressed by McKnight on all fronts. That they're doing incredible work on the grant making side and impact investing and the endowment and the net zero uh, pledge is great. Um, we've taken a slightly different approach, but that doesn't mean we won't get to where Tanya is. Our approach has been what we're calling divest invest or invest divest, and others have been taking a similar approach. Um, and that is to say, we are divesting from fossil fuels at the same time as Tanya noted, we're seeking to invest uh, very rapidly into the kinds of clean energy and other uh, uh, equitable um, oriented uh, and effective uh, solutions that are out there. And we think that there's enormous promise in, in doing that. Um, so that's one piece. I'd say a second, just to link up to where Val started, the other piece of a very aggressive alignment we're doing is looking at our asset managers and focusing on the percentage um, and the number of those who are uh, um, uh, the, the asset managers who are led by people of color and women um, and, and you know, committing to bring that that number up and to doing that in a um, in a thoughtful and and um, and considered way. Um, and I just would hit once again Val's key point, which is not only can you do this, you can do this and get the same returns, if not uh, frankly better. So if anybody's worried about their fiduciary duty, uh, I'm not um, in terms of of doing the alignment um, with MacArthur's endowment. I definitely want to talk about our, our boards and our finance and investment committees because I bet you those are folks who are asking those questions. Um, but before we get there, let's talk about the, the moment in time that each of you are doing this work, which is, you know, we've been, we're almost into the end of year two of a pandemic. Communities are just in incredible need and, um, you know, and the resources that we need to be driving to them are serious and real. And so I just wonder how, if at all, um, both the pandemic and the reckoning with racial inequality and other issues have affected your mission aligned values driven investing well i'm happy to jump in on this um so i i think a lot about um two thought leaders who have shared two points that make this work even more urgent um one is that if our endowment um which is 94 percent of our assets is working against our grant portfolio or our, our programmatic objectives then we're getting beat before we even make it into the office to make a grant and so i always just think about it like we have to be in alignment because if we're not in alignment we're undermining all of the good that we think we're trying to achieve and that's why I think it's so important to us to be in alignment. And then the second, um, which is one that um, our colleague um, Darren Walker from the Ford Foundation said, uh, when they made the commitment to divest um, their uh, investment portfolio, and it was his quote was, "What's the purpose of perpetuity if you don't have a planet?" And that right there, I feel like that's a wow. microphone drop every time mm -hmm. I say it, because it just is so critical. Like we cannot yeah. um, put our heads in the sand on this. And we know that this is not a programmatic um, shift. It's really a societal shift. And that societal shift really requires that we have the economic systems to support that shift. And I would say the same thing around racial equity and particularly having a diverse diversity of fund managers 
um, and invest and, and investments inside of your portfolio. It is work that we are beginning. Uh, we're far ahead on climate because it's the work that we've been committed to for a very long time. Um, but it is work that we are digging into as well. And, and to Val's point, that what you find is that these are not things that are in opposition of each other. They're actually things that reinforce each other so that you, as long as we are lifting up constantly these questions about is our portfolio um, climate resilient? Is our portfolio racially diverse? Um, and what is our what are these managers that we're thinking about? What are they doing? Uh, let's ask them. Let's hold them accountable. Because I think when we ask the question, when you have the resources to invest as a limited partner, then that alone helps shift and change the dynamics with these um, uh, fund managers. And that's what we, I would say we all need to be doing is pushing and pressing, um, making sure that these priorities are um, on their agendas because it's not just from us, right? Like we see to your point, ESG um, demands that are happening in the market as well. And so the more pressure, the more alignment, the more action and the more progress is the way I think about it. And I'd love to build on that. I feel like uh, it's a great segue um, to answer the question about the pandemic and everything that's going on around us. I think the pandemic, as we all know, um, shed light. It didn't cause uh, the wealth gap. It didn't cause the systemic bias. It shed light on it. it George Floyd's murder didn't suddenly cause police brutality. It just shed light on something that had been happening for years and years and years. And when we look at systemic bias in our capital markets in Wall Street, um, a, a statistic that makes my mouth drop um, is that 98% of our assets globally are managed by white male led companies. And that is simply a statistic that needs to change. It doesn't make any logical sense. And then when you ask why, and, and you're, like someone like myself who's been in the business a long time, you actually start to realize, is it racism or is it just a system that needs to be changed? You know, and it might be a little of both, but when you look at the system that defaults to the same subset of people, and it actually isn't even a diverse set of Caucasian males, it's a subset within a subset. It's a very small group of, of entities. And so what we did that I hope can be replicated is we sort of redefined risk and redefined how we look at selection of managers and how we diligence managers. Um, just one quick example, the norm on Wall Street, and I use Wall Street to mean you know, the broader financial industry, is you look at managers that have worked together for a long time to say, we can put money into managers that have been together for a long time that will reduce our risk. Well, most diverse managers haven't been given the opportunity to work together for a long time. So I look at managers that have financial chops that maybe they've worked somewhere before for a long time. They have a good track record, but maybe they haven't been able to work together. And so we, we have invested in fund one, fund two, and fund three, and maybe it's their first time working together and we still have, have this great result from a data standpoint, but you're not gonna find a black manager that's worked with another black manager for 30 years. It just doesn't exist, you know? And so we have to start redefining the system and we have to change that system. And then we're going to see these results we need to see. And that's what I think the pandemic and the George Floyd murder really signified this past few years is let's change our systems. We don't have to continue to operate in a system that is full of bias. That's, uh, those are great points, Val. And, and when you think about the 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 screens that you use to choose folks, were part of what was holding that system in place, right? That's what you just said. Um, John, did you want to add anything there? I just had two two tiny points because again, I think Tony and Val have really covered it super well. Um, you know, the first on the timing, I do think that any of us who are not involved in or recognizing the fierce urgency of now, uh, you know, in light of what's happened, less fierce is not awake um, and or paying attention enough. And so, yes, of course, there's a there's an imperative based on the times we live in. I see it, you know, largely through the lens of the racial and ethnic um, and gender, uh, you know, wealth gap. I think that's a, a totally appropriate frame, one of many frames 
of course, in the, that we could use, but, but one that's very powerful, I think, uh, here. And I then translate that to something that we have been pursuing at MacArthur Foundation, which uh, I like the term business diversity, because um, I think it encompasses a lot of activities. It's a, a, a uh, term coined by John Rogers, and Val mentioned there are very few uh, black asset managers who have been doing this for 30 years, but John Rogers is one of them at, at Ariel, of course, um, enormously successfully. Um, and he calls on us to look, yes, at the asset managers, but also look at the law firms we're hiring, look at the accounting firms we're hiring, look at the marketing firms and so forth, um, and make sure that the way in which we are putting our dollars back in the community is addressing the racial and ethnic uh, and gender uh, wealth gaps and pay gaps. And, and so in that larger frame, I think we have uh, got a tighter and more effective focus uh, on what we're doing at MacArthur. And, and that's, you know, of course, others will choose different frames, but I like that business diversity frame. That sounds like a great um, way to think through all the various ways, touch points that you have. I also wanted to just drop in a reference here to the Knight Foundation has a report that's about the diversification of foundation asset managers that has been tracking the data um, and has some really terrific information in there. So we will share that back out at the end of this um, session and the resources as well. Well, so let's uh, let's talk about getting started. And John, I'm going to ask you to go first this time so that you know your colleagues on the panel don't take all the um, insights before that we get to you. Um, <laughs> but we're just talking about, you know, many, many folks have been in this for a while. Um, even the panelists on this call have talked about their own areas for growth, um, even though they're very deep and committed in certain areas. So maybe if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about um, uh, how you got started, what advice you'd have for your colleagues as they get started, um, and, and maybe a focus on, on boards and investment committees, as we mentioned. Sure, Kathleen, so much to say here, so there's no way I'll, I'll hit it all before we get to Valentina. Um, if there were two takeaways that, that we might offer, one is just start, and second is it's doable, and we can talk more about that um, along the way. But Kathleen, you invoked the Knight Foundation, and I will uh, start there, because in, in some ways for me, that, that's where it begins. I was um, proud to be the board chair of Knight Foundation when they began uh, uh, working on that report and, and have now issued a second report, as you may know. Um, the work there is really led by Juan Martinez, the amazing uh, CFO who is on your board, I believe, Kathleen uh, Alberto Abarguen, uh, our counterpart as CEO. Um, John Rogers was a board member, um, as you may know, of, of Knight um, and others, uh, and Cambridge Associates, which has been the outsourced CIO for a two plus billion dollar Knight Foundation um, endowment. And they really have charged ahead on the assets uh, manager's diversity topic for many, many years, and then have put out this report that helps us, I think, all to benchmark what we're doing. So this is something that I've been devoted to through that frame for a long time. Uh, when I came to MacArthur a couple of years ago as president, it was a very early conversation that I had with our board, our investment committee, uh, and our, our amazing uh, team uh, in the CIO's office and our impact investing team. Um, and, you know, we, we have been uh, but there's been some focus before I got there, and, and there is, is now uh, more focus on it in the last couple of years. I would say, of course, getting the board on board and getting your investment committee uh, to, to come along is essential. Thinking about who are the members of the investment committee, who are the outside members you bring, um, that, that matters a, a great deal. Um, but of course, it has to be led and implemented by your by the CEO, whether that's in-house or um, out-of-house. And, and there are great professionals who are doing this work and figuring out just what Val has figured out, which is that uh, incredible alignment for where um, using one of these lenses or series of lenses results in um, not just uh, you know our, our wonderful fiduciary duty being being honored, but but in fact outperforming. Um, and I think that's absolutely possible. So much more to get into that. But you know, without having Sue Manske, the CIO, without having Deborah Schwartz, who leads our impact investment, their teams doing it, as well as the board and the impact investing and the uh, investment committee. Uh, of course, it's not going to take place over time, but it's totally doable uh, to get that group engaged, and it's totally doable to get a higher return as a result. That's great. So it's doable and get going. That's what I hear from you. Val, just uh, why don't you talk talk about particularly maybe to community foundation folks um, about your starting uh, points and what what they might draw. Absolutely. And, and I think we have to all recognize that most community foundations, our boards are all volunteer and they really want to do a good job and they take that fiduciary responsibility seriously. But for me, it starts with education. Um, there's a lot to learn around investment strategies, um, all the different asset classes, what are global equities versus domestic equities versus private asset, uh, you know, and we just did a whole um, change of policy around our, our private alternative class because that's an area where a lot of external consultants don't wanna delve too much because they're smaller in number and they're a little more risky and they're not as liquid and even just understanding 
liquidity versus illiquidity. And so there's all this financial terminology that we can't assume everyone on the investment committee understands every single thing. It's It can be very, very confusing. And so I think education around terminology, education around what the investment policy statement of your particular community foundation means and what the intention is. And then to John's point, you can't rely on your external consultant to do everything. You have to have staff that can drive the process because external consultants are paid to work for many, many clients. And the one thing that I learned when I came on board was that most community foundations, and this can be a double-edged sword, they push to get a very low price from their external consultants. And that can be a good thing and that can be a bad thing. It's a good thing because you don't want to pay a lot of money, but it can be a bad thing because then what happens is you have a lot of external consultants using a cookie cutter sort of manager selection process. There's a lot of index um, indexing, and I don't exactly support that because that a lot of hidden things happen within indices um, and ETFs and mutual funds um, because it's easy to do. Uh, but I actually found that within one of our mutual funds, there was a chemical-based company and a fossil fuel company. And we are also um, aiming to net zero and um, a, a pro-climate focus. And so it was hidden because our investment committee had no idea. So my point is, you really have to have your staff engaged, you can't rely on others, and you have to take the time to have education and really be committed to going through every single manager in your portfolio in every asset class. And that's what we're doing right now. And for us, again, it's about the racial equity and the diversity and making sure that we're hitting you know, the, the priorities for us. But it's, it's something that we have lawyers involved, we have colleagues involved, we have vendors, we have the board, we have the investment committee, as well as the staff. Complete buy-in from, you know, every aspect of our community foundation, and we're willing to share it with other community foundations. Well, I think you just said the key part at the end there, Val, um, because I know, uh, you know, we hit, about, we hit upon something really important, which is the reason that community foundations drive down the price on that is because, you know, do their donor advised fund assets, they are providing a rich, important service for not a lot of money. <laughs> and so there's a business model question in there that gets complicated. So. Um, I'm sure the, the extent to which you can help others make it easier and get started um, would be incredibly um, well received. Thank you for that. So Tanya, I'm going to ask you to focus on the board piece since I know that um, you, you have a lot of uh, detailed uh, experience coming from Skillman and going to McKnight, working with two different boards on this topic, and I'm sure you've, you've um, gotten some resistance and then figured out your way through. So talk to me about, about the go governance aspect of getting started and what, what, where you would encourage folks to look there. Yeah, I think it's really, I'm, I'm glad you raised this point about boards because I do think that we, um, you know, Val talked about educating boards, educating staff, um, and I think for our board, uh, particularly at McKnight Foundation, we have a family foundation. It's a family board. And because of their programmatic commitment to climate, it was a lot easier for them to lean into this notion of mission um, investments. And so a lot of people think that it's actually harder. Uh, and I don't know, it, you know, what's the saying? You've seen one foundation, you've seen one foundation. <laughs> Same thing goes for a board. But what I would say is, is that if, if you have board members who are really dedicated to the mission of the foundation and the purpose of the foundation, then lean in on that. Lean in on the alignment there. And then also lean in on helping them to understand that you're not going to take a haircut in your returns, because I think that's the biggest um, challenge that they have. So particularly when we got to this question of net zero, our net zero commitment, um, what I think our board wrestled mostly with was we were only the second foundation to make that commitment. And we had we spent time with our board talking to other institutions who also made that commitment, which were like um, uh, in Harvard and University of Michigan uh, endowment to talk with them about like, what does it take? What will it mean? And what I think they found comfort in was that 
there isn't a clear path. We don't know exactly how to do it, but we all have committed to try and figure out how to do it together. Um, and that we know, honestly, <laughs> that Harvard and University of Michigan's uh, returns are stellar. So if they're willing to figure this out, then it gives my board confidence like, oh, we can figure that out. And then the last thing is, is having the talent on board. Um, John referenced this, having the talent and the data. Um, our, uh, our leader here, Elizabeth McGovern, is excellent. I mean, she has led mission investment and she's leading our full investment portfolio. And part of that is really knowing that portfolio, digging deep, going to get the data that you'll need. I know that we're engaging with Linux Park, where I think that MacArthur has done so as well, which is going to give us the data of diversity across our portfolio. So you got to know where you're starting from to figure out where you're going, but you don't have to wait to fully get all of that data to just start and to own the principles and the values behind these types of commitments. Mm, that's terrific wisdom. Uh, other other governance uh, insights or barriers or things you wish you knew when you got going from either um, John or Val? Kathleen, one other thing I would just offer really quickly is I would say push on your consultants. Um, I know that they can't do it all. Push on your consultants, push on your OCIOs. And if your board is committed to this, they can also push on it. So when they're in manager meetings, when they're learning, you know, sometimes they have these broad meetings, keep raising the topics. I think it's not just what we do with the portfolio, which that is the most important, but that we can't underestimate the role of advocacy, advocacy from staff, advocacy from our board members um, to consultants and to um, OCIOs, because we need all of them. We need that section to Val's point they need to change too. Like the more consultants and OCIO providers change, the more likely we are gonna get better at um, having more diverse portfolios, having more climate resilient portfolios. That makes a lot of sense. John was about to pop in. I was, yeah, Tanya, I would just add, add to that a couple of things that I think are, are really just double clicks, but on, um, uh, on Linux Park, this is a, a arrangement that, that we set up in partnership with Kresge initially, but it's it's expanded now to many foundations and and also big banks um, have uh, have been working with Jason Lemon and his team. And if anybody is early on uh, getting started or at any point in the journey mm. and is worried about the measurement of whether you have certain number of assets under management or number of uh, managers in particular, this means that they don't all have to do the same thing. They can draw upon this database that we're all participating in. Honestly, it'd be really helpful if we all jumped in and, and agreed on a standard on a platform um, and I say that even having been quite involved in the Knight Foundation report having a data set that we are yet using and every time we go to a manager not asking them to fill out a different form across a thousand foundations would be much more helpful um, so anyway that's just a, 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 a nudge there uh, in terms of Linux, Linux Park and they are um, eager to work with more foundations across the sector and that's a replicable just... insight for so many different things not having repeated forms that everyone has to fill out <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, um, I'll add to that, uh, we actually hired a third party metrics vendor for the impact uh, of some of the diverse managers that we've selected, um, wanting to be able to measure that impact alongside the financial return, because there's so much of a focus on financial return, which is important, um, and you get that data for your audit and your financial reporting, but we wanted to also be able to see the impact we're having in community um, and uh, the SDGs, and so that's important to us. And then kind of building on what um, the Linux Park model, I also think that we should think about a way in the future that we can share due diligence summaries on some of our managers, because that is a big gating item to actually allocate money to some diverse managers who are starting out, is being able to share that information. Um, and I'm happy to and we're you know we're happy to so that's just something that is starting to kind of bubble up in discussion around community foundations that's terrific um i was just thinking about getting started and how we can help others you know just do it as you said john uh, i'm paraphrasing um 
so talk to me a little bit about, you know, in, in each of your cases, um, you know, you're lining up your values with your, um, with all of your assets. Uh, and that's, that's difficult, thorny stuff. And so how do you, how do you stage it? Um, what are the implications that it has for, you know, for internal uh, work, potentially even work between the, the programmatic areas like your climate uh, grant makers, as well as your investors, um, so that others can get a little bit more robust picture of how this actually goes. Happy to start, Kathleen, unless you want someone else to. Um, you know, I, I think you're, you're beginning with the alignment pieces just right. So, and again, I, I want to restate, hasten to say, much of this began before I got to MacArthur, so this is not just about, about me or what I've done, but um, in the last couple of years, we have focused very much on restating our values. So we had about 14 values when I first got to MacArthur. Nobody could tell me what they were. Literally no staff knew all the 14 values. We went through an exercise that brought it down to five. I think we're getting closer to people knowing, being able to state what our values are, So um, and making sure that's connected to our mission statement, which people do remember. It barks, it's on NPR all the time. Um, so getting a sense of what that is has been been very, very important. Um, and then, as, just as you said, Kathleen, you know, there are different buckets of assets and different processes that are not necessarily aligned, just naturally not necessarily aligned in a, in a historic, uh, in our case, legacy foundation. So if you think about the grant making, let's just stick with climate for a second. We've got a team that puts out a certain number of uh, grants every year. We've got our impact investing group. We organize ourselves a little differently. We have a carve out about $500 million um, toward impact investing, which is impact first. Um, we can come back to that. We actually are okay with the concessionary return if we think the impact is um, is you know high enough. So we'll do that. Um, and then our our uh, um, broader endowment, which is um, uh, the one we've really been talking about here. But make sure all those people are connected and have a, a, a process for pulling in the same direction, sharing the knowledge. Even Val's point about the diligence between them. So if we know something about a particular approach to uh, to climate, uh, uh, you know, particular technology, say, you know, our, do do each part of our organization know what the scientists in one part know, uh, and, and that, again, doesn't happen on its own. So figuring out how to do that alignment um, has been a part of it. So it is sort of a governance exercise, um, and, and, and a good one, I think, a healthy one, and I think one in which our staff have been quite engaged in, in a positive way. Thank you for that, Phil. Yeah, um, I think it's, it's really taking the time to understand how your values live out into the portfolio it's one thing to say climate or racial equity, but then being able to actually embody that. So as an example, community is important to us. We're a community foundation. And so when we talk about racial equity and community, what does that mean? When I looked at our portfolio, when I first came on board, even those funds that were invested in um, ESG, for example, I would say 98% of our managers were based in New York and Boston and were in California. And so I immediately started to look for managers based in Northern California and California, which granted there aren't as many as in New York and Boston, but that was a priority for us. And so that's one area. And then also understanding within asset classes, how even the asset class itself might impact racial equity. One example, venture capital is not necessarily friendly to community. Venture capital has sort of a, a strategy of get in and exit quick and make your your investors as much money as possible and i found a venture capital fund uh, called supply change led by a mexican woman who went to mit and it's all about sustainable food and she has extended the venture capital model to be more patient capital i fell in love with her story we've invested in her and we're telling other people about her and it's that sort of change maker where where she's not only and she's based in california so that's a plus but the point is she's making systemic changes to the venture capital asset class so when we talk about making systemic change to the finance world we're doing it throughout our investment strategies but that means i'm having to take a little bit more time to really get to know the managers that we're investing in and that is okay, that's part of my job, but it, this doesn't happen quickly, I think would be my message. It really is a deep commitment to aligning your values to something that is very, very real. I met with her in person, even though we're in a pandemic, that was important to me. Well, that's great. And, and you know, she's, she's not going to be able to make the difference that um, you're hoping she'll make in the industry unless she gets more investment. So, um, uh, you know, you, you plugging her here is a, is a terrific thing too. 
Um, Tony, did you want to add anything to this question? We're getting some questions from the audience. I'll turn to after this. Yeah, I'll just try and do this briefly. Um, at McKnight, our mission is to um, um, advance a more just, creative, abundant future where people and planet thrive. And uh, when we renewed our mission statement in 2019, we also um, built in our commitment to um, climate and racial equity. And so we made deep investments in both of those areas. And part of what I have tried to do since my arrival is to really make sure that we're not just focusing on these two things as our headlines, that they also become through lines in every aspect of our work. Um, and the way that John talked about it from you know, business diversity, business sustainability in every place, like that we have to be strong advocates that are purpose driven in every move that we we make um, around our work. And um, I would just say uh, as a result of that, I think that um, we were able to build off of the foundation's strong history um, of mission investments. So we right now have about 500 million that's invested in public and private impact investments that provide ideas to uh, technology, software, and all kinds of services that decarbonize the economy. And what we've also found is that as we've done this work over the last seven years, is that we've um, quickly, I'm surprisingly, but really quickly, we're now at 40% of our endowment has some type of mission alignment. And what we found is that we don't want to press ourselves to say we're going to be 100% or 75%. What we want to do is make sure that we're being thoughtful, but we're also being aggressive to find that. So we are find the opportunities that are really aligned with our, our mission. And so our impact investments are uncapped. And so that's why I think um, we could find uh, that our board could make this next step around net zero because it was the next logical step. And it's really about getting to that other 95% of our assets. How do we get fully aligned? Um, but I think the big, big picture here, and I wanna um, build off of both um, Val and particularly John's point, this is not something that you start and it turns overnight. This is a long commitment. And that's why some people have asked us, what well, you're making a commitment by 2050? What does that mean? Oh, we're far more ambitious than that. We're going to try and move a lot faster than that. But I, we want people to understand that this is a long term commitment. This is not a one and done. This is not a whim, you know, kind of like um, something that just happens and we're now all excited about it. It's not a, fa a fad. This has to really be the way we do our work going forward. And we gotta give ourselves the time, the energy to really restructure our systems, restructure our approach so that we're in alignment with values for the long term and that the work is durable, not just um, episodic. Thanks for adding that color to it, Tanya. Yes. Um, well, that was that it kind of goes to one of the audience questions was just more about the specific types of investments. You named one there, Val, you were talking about some of yours. Maybe, John, I can ask you to um, just, you know, detail a couple of the other ways in which your endowment is um, being used to, to be values aligned than, than the ones that you've talked about so far. Sure, I, mean, I would really, really echo what Tanya just said there about about a long process and and one that is it's like you know, it, it is easy to get started. It's not that easy to do it. I think in a way that we're going to feel that proud about over time. But but I'm confident we will. Um, and uh, and so I'm happy to talk about a couple specifics. So um, I love Val's invocation in, in the venture capital setting. If you imagine venture capitalists who actually were investing in community in a particular, that's not one of our values. But I was just thinking about the Cleveland Avenue um, venture firm here in Chicago. Um, you may know Don and Liz Thompson, amazing family uh, from here in Chicago. Don, they both um, went to Purdue, incredibly uh, uh, smart, talented engineers, and uh, he became president of McDonald's Corporation. Um, and post uh, doing that, he started a venture firm uh, here in Chicago, and they have a number of different things that they're investing in. Food happens to be one of them. Um, but they also have a fund called Cast Us, and this is a partnership with the state of Illinois, um, and they're really specifically investing venture style in the south and west sides of Chicago, and they're investing in predominantly 
predominantly black and uh, brown and uh, women run businesses, women owned businesses, um, and seeking to invest directly in communities. So I think that when you look, you're going to find people who are absolute A-listers, as the Thompsons are. You're going people who have enormous, uh, you know, experience in the business sector of deep connections to community and who are leading funds. And you know that 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 is one example we could go down the list. Um, and uh, so I, I, let me pause there because I, I got too enthusiastic and uh, and spend the rest of the time. No, it's a tra it's a terrific example. And again, you know, with the piggybacking, there's a little bit of just drawing light. You know, if you care about Chicago and you care about um, women-owned, black-owned, um, minority-owned businesses, that you know, this is a terrific um, uh, group to go with. Val mentioned a, a food sustainability, um, a private equity investor that was that was really helpful. So, um, Val, did you want to add to this point? Uh, yeah, I would love to because I want to. I, I want to be clear that I think it can happen in all asset classes, and uh, we were very thoughtful about a global equity investment. We actually moved some money out of a big sort of big name fund, um, and and I want to circle back to something that was mentioned earlier. Without going into detail or names, we found that the big fund we were invested with, it's a name everyone knows, um, were actually politically misaligned with our values. And uh, you know most big funds have PACs, and just you should be aware of that. And and you know it, it's fine. Um, it's something that happens, but it was misaligned with our particular values. And so we moved our money into a, a woman-led fund out of Oakland in Global Equities, which is a you know which is liquid. It's very large. It's in uh, marketable securities. But she leads shareholder activism. So what that means is um, you have to look at the entire company. And so when we talk about climate, she invests for climate, but she found that one company um, that does very good work on climate and reducing fossil fuels did not have board diversity and had a pay wage gap between men and women. So she led a shareholder activism movement, got them to listen, so she kept our position in that. But that's the kind of thing we want to be involved with, still making great returns, but very, very active in holding companies accountable. You can't just do one thing. You've got to be good top to bottom. I agree with that, Val. And that's one of our um, tenets in our investments, our mission investment portfolio, um, well, across our entire portfolio, is to have shareholder uh, activism. Um, so show up in those conversations. Again, this is about our role as advocates around how that capital how our endowments are being used to either support or undermine our missions. And so that's definitely one way of that, one way of doing that. And then I would just share, I'm really excited about a recent investment we've made uh, on the mission investment front, which is really um, to uh, a uh, emerging firm. It's the first round investment, um, black led that is making investments in helping um, ESOPs come to fruition. So finding businesses that actually want to make a transition to employee owned businesses, supporting them, helping them make that transition so that you, they're actually transferring wealth um, to, um, to the employees uh, and particularly in uh, places where there are brown and black employees who would never have access to these type of opportunities. So, you know, it's like, you know, lots of interesting things out there. I think we can all do if we um, have our consultants or have our staff look for innovative solutions, because those aren't the things that are going to come through your consultants. Like you got to go out and shake, you know, shake it a little bit and figure out like where, where can you find these innovative approaches there. It does require work. Um, but just like you would look for a great um, grant partner, it's going to require work for you to do that too. Thank you, Tanya. There's one more question I want to get in from the audience before I just turn to closing remarks from each of you. And, and it's really about how you measure or or think about or talk about your results in this area, because you're we're saying out loud that financial results are not the whole thing. Um, so do any of you have a you know, a, 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 a tight, I bet just a complicated answer is my main point, but does anyone have like a, um, a short form answer that might satisfy the, the audience? Well, one, we actually produce a report every year 
um, or every other year or so um, that actually looks at the impact to see whether or not that impact really did come to fruition in addition to what was the economic returns um, for that particular investment. Um, and, and then the last is that we also count a learning impact too. So we know that when we're making these mission aligned investments, that we should be learning from that on our programmatic side, because we know like the, we need to understand how economic actors are working, advancing, how to shift and change them so that our grant making is complementary to our economic um, investments, as well as those endowment investments are complementary to our uh, grant making. So we're, we're always trying to um, triangulate those three things, impact, returns, and learning uh, in a way that gives us. And so we're happy to share that report um, with anyone who's interested. That'll go out with the resources. Thank you, Tanya. And, and we hired, as I mentioned, we hired a third party firm called Upmetrics and they have created um, standardization within different verticals to measure impact. So obviously if you're measuring fossil fuel reduction, that's a measurable way um, of measuring impact. It's going to be different if you're looking at education, it might be how many people you know, went out and were able to get their GED or graduate. Um, if you're looking at healthcare, there's going to be a different measurement, but there is becoming some standardization around impact. And for us, it's not so much um, how you're measuring it, but just understanding what our dollars are doing in that area because we we will always have the financial return um, from the funds and from our portfolio manager but the impact is something that we we like to see and as long as there's some standardization of that impact measurement within each sector then we're okay with that and i just quickly add that we have a learning and evaluation group at macarthur and you know for different activities such as uh, let's take within impact investing something we call the catalytic capital consortium a partnership um, with a few other foundations you know we are we do evaluations at that level as well and i think things that you have evaluated as grants um, for a long time or grant making programs can be uh, evaluated in this way too the other piece i would say though tactically is just thinking about the incentives that your team has and so building these into the compensation structure mm -hmm. for those who are uh, who are putting your money to work um, it is not only now a financial return in the compensation metrics for our team and that that, um, that does broadly speaking get the human attention that is a very good point thank you for that john well, I'm just going to wrap it up with one final question for each of you, which is just about what's next, either what's next for your individual institution or what do you think should be is next uh, for the field on this topic. Tanya, I'll ask you to go first, if you don't mind. Oh, okay, I was hoping that I could hear others. Um, what I would say, I think what's next for us is that we just want to deepen our practice and to share it. So we just made this commitment um and we're investigating as you know we're trying to grow our in, um, investments in diverse fund managers so we want to just get really good at those two things and to make sure that we um, make it accessible and that we are serving as supports for others in the field who want to make this leap um, we're all in this together um, this is not about who's first, who's second. And by the way, David Rockefeller was first on this net zero um, question. This is really about how do, you know, what's the saying? Like, it's not about um, going along. It's about how far we can go together. Thanks, Tanya. I will uh, jump in and leave Val the last word. Uh, you know, I, I would just say, I really hope that we will be able to collaborate through this and uh, and really just offer, I'm happy to be a resource if it's helpful for, for those who, anything that we've done at MacArthur is helpful as a way to um, discuss. I've been at a number of other people's boards. We've had other foundation presidents come to talk to our board. I'm happy to do that. Um, Kathleen earlier had said, you know, think about resources. You know, I do think the human resources are the, the principal one. There are documents and so forth we can share. But if on the climate front, we haven't talked about Ellen Dorsey at, at Wells Global, but she's incredible on this topic and I know is known to this community. Uh, we did mention Juan Martinez, uh, CFO at Knight Foundation, certainly on the um, asset managers of uh, managers of color. He's unbelievable. We could go down the list. I'm not volunteering their time, um, but they both are, uh, are great and, uh, and there are many others in our field. So anyway, I look forward to, to partnering uh, with many and, and grateful to uh, our staff at MacArthur and certainly to, to the council and everybody's teams for making this happen. Thank you, John. Yeah, I, I feel exactly the same. Um, I do think 
that we have to see more equitable distribution of capital. Um, I didn't mention that I, we've also made some big changes on the programmatic side on PRIs. We've implemented impact investing from DAFs, um, loan guarantees and loans and private equity, which is also a little bit unique. And we're sharing that um, process with other community foundations. But I think what we've hit on, Tanya mentioned that there are $3 billion fund and some people think that's big and some people think that's small. And I think my point would be if we put all of our assets together, um, we have a lot more leverage. And I do think that finance and change in finance scares a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And if we think of the trillions of dollars of assets under management, philanthropic capital has an obligation to lead, in my opinion. And I say that with, with my heart, not, not in any sort of um, judgmental way. I, I really do believe that we should be leading we should be setting an example and we can do it in a collaborative way. And um, I am of Cherokee heritage and we have a saying, a word gadugi, which means working in the community for the good of all. And I would love to see shared practices, shared services. Um, you've mentioned uh, the Knight Foundation. I know the Nathan Cummings Foundation just published a whole book on um, how to move to racial equity in your foundation assets. Um, I'm the board chair of Intentional Endowment Network. We also have a handout. So, I mean, I think if we all come together and just figure out how to collaborate, think of the dollar amounts we could move and, and just really make a difference because it's time for change. It's It's been time for a long time, but let's make it now. What an inspiring um, sentiment to end on. So I want to thank all three of you very much for your leadership here, for your commitment, and particularly just now for sharing your insights with the rest of us. And thank you everyone for joining us, and we will certainly get the resources that were mentioned here out to you in short order. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Kathleen. Bye-bye.